that this chapter is all about praising and rejoicing and thanksgiving to God. What a coincidence, hey? And we are going through um, this book, Habakkuk. This is our fifth sermon so far, and we're actually going to, Lord willing, cover the whole uh, chapter today, verse by verse, as we continue our study. And so the title of the message is Joy in Thanksgiving and Praise from Habakkuk chapter 3. And you know the first two chapters, they were really a question and answer time between the prophet and the Lord. And he was struggling with things and asking his questions. And now we come to chapter 3. It's a short chapter, and it's quite different because it's a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. So would you follow along with me, and we'll read a few of the verses before we uh, study them. Verse 1 and 2 to start. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigionoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And then just jump down and have a preview of verse 17 to 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me to walk on my high hills. And so, Lord, as we come before your word now, We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done for us. And even when life is hard, Lord, help us to see the clear perspective of how good you are and how much you're working for our good in our lives. Lord, help us to rejoice in you and to choose joy. Lord, to rejoice in the gift of salvation and Lord, to continue trusting you through the trials. Lord, help us believe your word and walk and live it out by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Habakkuk chapter 3, we have now come to the place where the prophet is worshiping the Lord. And you remember the outline of, um, well, actually, here's the outline of the chapter that we're about to study. In the first two verses, we'll see a prayer for revival. Then in the middle section, we'll see a psalm of remembering And then by the end, we'll see that hymn of faith and of praise that we just read. And what we see in this chapter compared to chapter 1 and 2 is that Habakkuk's heart has softened. He started out with, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why aren't you acting? And God, save us. And and God, destroy the wicked. And now he's heard the Lord's response in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. And now he's crying out to God for mercy for his people. You see, he has a soft heart now. This is a soft prayer chapter where he's, he's humbled and he's crying out for help. And it shows how this process of trusting God causes us to, to soften our hearts before the Lord. We should bring our questions. We should bring our needs and our burdens. And then we should listen because the Lord will answer And when he answers, we can either harden our heart and say, I don't believe that, I don't like that, I don't get that, I don't want that. Or we can soften our heart and say, Lord, you are God, I'm not. And you know what's best. And I choose to cry out now for mercy. Look at verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth. (laughs) What is a Shigionoth? (laughs) It's a crazy word. It's a musical instrument. Uh, You say, what kind is it? I don't know. No one knows for sure that I could find. It's a cool sounding one. It has a very nice name. You know, bring your harmonica, bring your xylophone. Oh, and don't forget your shigianoth today. (laughs) Kind of sounds like someone sneezing. I don't know if that's what the music sounds like. You know, we do have a couple of uh, band teachers at our church thinking of Ami Collado and and Graham Hoffman. They've taught music before. Maybe they know a bit more about it. You can ask them later. But the point in verse 1 is that he's composing the rest of this message with a musical vibe. 
because he's turning his heart to prayer and to praise. And it includes deep requests, but also praise to God and even joy, joyful thanksgiving by the end of the chapter. And what we see is this great progression in his life. Remember back in chapter two, after he threw all his questions at the Lord, back in chapter two, verse one, he said, I will stand my watch, I'll set myself on the rampart, I'll watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when God corrects me. And now we see that Habakkuk has received correction, he's received wisdom from the Lord, and he's received truth. And although he doesn't understand it all, he softened his heart to not fight against the things of God, but to pray about these things that he, he still doesn't fully understand, but he's starting to believe. And this is part of our journey of faith, is praying and softening our heart and calling out for understanding and mercy. Do you remember the, the overview of the whole book, the stages of learning to live by faith? There's the questioning stage, that was chapter one and the beginning of two. Then there's the trusting stage, that was the rest of chapter two, how the just shall live by faith, faith in the promises of God, that God is in control, that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And Habakkuk is now starting to trust God. When he gets to chapter three, he starts to praise. And he's in this praising stage here, beginning with this prayer and turning to joyful praise. He goes from protest to praise, from wrestling to worshiping, and from sighing to singing. And the pivot point is in the middle there. It's trusting, it's faith. It's saying, oh yeah, Lord, you said the just shall live by faith. I'm gonna take you at your word. And so now look at verse two at this prayer. He says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk now surrenders to what God has said to him and he prays for revival and for God's mercy. Revive your work in the midst of the years. You know, revival is often a churchy buzzword today, but what really is revival according to scripture? It is the act of bringing something back to life, something that was alive, but has died back and gone dormant, but it needs to be revived. And Habakkuk is praying for the people of God, the people in the Old Testament, the Jews, Israel, Jerusalem, the people of Judah, and he's saying, Lord, we've gone back to idolatry and sin. Would you revive us even in these days? And verse two is also a good prayer for us to pray for our culture and our city and town. Revive us, O Lord. You know, the Bible says in many places that we are last days believers. And so what will happen to the believers as the Lord's return becomes nearer and nearer? Well, the Bible tells us that in this world, sin will increase and even apostasy in the so-called church will increase and continue to rise. And so the times ahead of us will get darker until the Lord returns. But yet we can pray for God's mercy and for revival, especially starting in the church and then out into the culture. There's no guarantee biblically of a revival. You may have heard some self-proclaimed prophets who assure you, oh yeah, revival is definitely around the corner. I heard a lot of that growing up and it didn't happen in the UK where I was growing up. And so you have to test all the things you hear with scripture. And biblically speaking, there's no guarantee of a revival before Jesus returns. However, we can still pray for one. We can still ask God, have mercy, Lord. Do a special work, revive your church and revive our culture, Lord, to the truth. We don't deserve revival, but we pray for it. And there are many problems that we face in this world and we can do a few practical things to help all the problems in the world, but we know as believers the real solution to bring truth and change in our society is a turning of the heart to God, a revival of truth back to scripture, back to truth and that begins with the church taking seriously what we believe and living it out and believing God and speaking boldly the the message of hope and truth 
And Habakkuk understands that this is a work of God's mercy. It's not something to earn or create in our own power. So he says, oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. It's your work, God, not ours. And it comes through prayer, not human uh, effort. And I'm thinking of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then the Lord says, I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. And then he goes on in that same chapter to say, God says, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. So the main thing we can do to help our culture and to bring truth is to pray. Pray for our nation, pray for our province, pray for our city to experience revival and faith and truth. Pray for our church family. Pray for each other. Pray for your friends, pray for your immediate family, but most importantly, pray for yourself. That you will be truly revived and on fire for the Lord. There was a great old preacher called Gypsy Smith. He was an ordinary, uneducated man, but when he preached the gospel and shared his testimony, people could relate and people responded to the message of the gospel like crazy wherever he went. And someone once asked Gypsy Smith, how do we get revival like we see in your life? And he famously said, it's simple, draw a circle around yourself and pray that everything within that circle would be revived and that nothing would be left unsurrendered to the Lord. Wow. In other words, start with yourself. And that's what Habakkuk is praying here. Lord, revive your work in us, but, but starting with me. God, I surrender my life. I ask for your help. I want to see your purposes, Lord, accomplished in my life. I'm not living for my purposes, Lord. I want to see your purposes done. That kind of prayer takes a lot of courage, by the way. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, not my will, but yours. I want your purposes in my life. That is a courageous prayer because God may have a purpose for you that is different than what you want right now or what you find comfortable or even attractive to do. But once you discover and you get on board with God's plan, you'll find that it is so much better than you thought. And it is so much more wonderful. So Lord, revive your work in me. I want to get on board with your plan. And also we can pray for this to happen in our time. Notice how he says in verse two, revive your work in the midst of the years. That phrase means, Lord, in our time, in our days, revive us, revive me and revive our culture, revive us back to Jesus Christ and back to the salvation and purpose of truth in these last days. What a sincere and godly prayer. And when that prayer is also followed by a surrendered life, willing to turn from comfort zones into truth and conviction and serving the Lord, putting away sins, even the weights that slow us down in our walk with God, watch what God will do. Here's a great prayer to pray. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And notice at the very end of verse two, what he bases this prayer on, not their righteousness, but mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk knows from what God has said that God is in the act right now of raising up the empire of Babylon to come down to Jerusalem and bring discipline upon his people. He knows the judgment of God is deserved and is coming, but he says, in your wrath, remember mercy. How relevant is that today for us in our culture? We know from the scriptures that Jesus is coming soon and will come suddenly, and we need to live ready. We also know that when he comes, there will be a cleanup operation on this unbelieving and wicked world. The wrath of God, his righteous judgment, the justice of God will be poured out. And when he does that, all the wrongs in this world will be put right. But that doesn't all have to be doom and gloom for us. What we can say is, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. And the reason God has not told us the day or the hour of his return, and the reason he delays Jesus coming for his bride and then bringing that judgment to the unbelieving world and unbelieving nation of Israel, is that his heart is for more mercy. God's heart is for more people 
to come to faith and to turn from sin before the judgment comes. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Here's another scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. In other words, he is coming, but he's long-suffering in the meantime toward us, not willing that any should perish. God desires that all would come to repentance. That's why the Lord has not come back yet that more people could be saved. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I'm not saved yet. Well, good. You need to realize that and then turn your life to Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him before time is up. And God is a merciful God in your mercy, Lord. And even in your wrath, remember mercy. He is merciful. Time is short and, and you're hearing this message today and it's not an accident that you're here or watching this because God is calling you to himself and saying, I've sent my son, I've died on the cross for you and risen again. I want you to be forgiven and saved, but you have to surrender your life and trust me. Jesus died in your place and the only way we can be saved is to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I urge you to receive that mercy of God today before the judgment comes. And let me just say before we move on to verse three, God has been merciful to all of us. God has been so gracious. And the fact that we're even alive and breathing despite our sin and rebellion, wow, God is merciful. And we have a lot to be thankful for and thankfulness starts with, oh God, you have given me life. God, you have paid the price for my sins. God, you have drawn me to yourself. God, you have been merciful to me. There's a lot we can be thankful for, and we should be thankful to the Lord, not just thankful to the universe, but to him. And it starts with the fact that he saved us, and he's shown us mercy more than we deserve. I know I deserve eternal separation from God, great wrath upon my life. That's what I deserve. And yet Jesus did it all for me on the cross and the resurrection. I'm thankful today. Anyone else thankful today for the mercy of God? Amen. Now we're going to cover verse 3 to 17 fast. And it is a psalm. It's a song about the acts of God, the mightiness of God. And Habakkuk is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, writing this scripture, and he looks back and remembers what God has done. His mighty work in the Old Testament, how he brought Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery in the days of Moses, and how he brought them into the promised land that he had promised them 400 years before. And it's recounting God's faithfulness in the past. And as Habakkuk is writing this, it's a song. He's getting his eyes off the sinful culture and he's getting his eyes onto the Lord. And by the way, this is how we experience true revival in our heart. We get our eyes off the culture and we get our eyes onto Jesus. And we remember what God has done for us. And so we look again at the outline. Now we're going into verse 3 to 16, the Psalm of Remembering. Look at verse 3 with me. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. By the way, Teman just means the south lands. This is describing God bringing them out of Egypt and through those lands toward the promised land. And by the way, everything we're going to read here is also poetry, and it's Hebrew poetry. And the Hebrews did not usually rhyme words the way we do. You know, our poetry is often a little simpler. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And we rhyme words like that. And it's so touching, isn't it? <laughs> Mary had a little lamb. Her father shot it dead. And now she takes that lamb to school between two bits of bread. <laughs> hey, I grew up in the UK. We had a lot of lamb around this year. I, I found that very encouraging. Uh, and if you think it's cruel, tell yourself that when you eat your turkey this afternoon or tomorrow. <laughs> My point is the Hebrews didn't rhyme words like we do. They actually rhymed thoughts. And they took a thought and they put a picture in it and then they put a second version of it, an emphasis, rhyming the thought with another picture. Look again at verse three. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. See, there's a, a rhythm to it. And then in the middle of verse three, there's this 
repeating couplet again, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Rhyming of thought. It's just the Hebrew style. It's a bit hard to read sometimes with our um, you know, modern minds, but, but hopefully that helps you follow. And what he's describing here is God's glory at work in visible ways in Israel's history during the Exodus. Look at verse four. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed his feet. So God was dealing with Israel's enemies. Remember the plagues of Egypt. And then in verse six, he remembers how all the surrounding nations had the chance to repent, they did not. They had the chance to welcome Israel, they did not. They attacked Israel and Israel's exodus became so uh, mighty in God's glory that the nations feared Israel. Look at verse six, so they feared the God of Israel. It says, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed, his ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. So he's talking about all those nations fearing God as Israel came out of Egypt. And in verse eight, he uses poetic language describing even the Red Sea in the Exodus. Verse eight, O Lord, you were displeased with the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? This is speaking of God's victory. Verse nine, your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows, Selah, speaking of Israel's, uh, of God's uh, victory again. You divided the earth with rivers. Verse 10, the mountains saw you and trembled. Think of Mount Sinai in the wilderness and the, the smoke and the fire and the, and the earthquake and the giving of the law in the Old Testament. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by the deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows, they went at the shining of your glittering spear. Now, verse 11 is not just poetry. He's describing a literal event that's recorded in Joshua 10 called Joshua's long day. When God helped Israel win a miraculous battle in the valley of Ayalon, and God controlled nature and extended the day and the sun and the moon literally stood still. Why? Because God did this for his people. And Habakkuk is remembering the goodness of God. He's remembering the faithfulness and the mercy of God. And this is how we can be thankful to the Lord. We can look back at our life and remember the good things he's done for us. And when you remember what God has done, it lifts your faith. It lifts your ability to keep moving forward, to keep trusting him even in hard times that you don't understand because, oh, God's always done mighty things in the past and he always works it out. Look at verse 12. Then he says, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck, Selah. In other words, God fully exposed those wicked tribes who did not welcome his people, but fought against his people and cursed his people. God dealt with them. And God did these things. It's interesting language, but it, it essentially means that none of Israel's enemies could stand against them when they trusted God. And this reminds us that God has never lost a battle. It may seem in the short term, like what is happening, God? Why is this all going downhill? But his purposes and his plans will be accomplished. And when God steps up to defend his people or to lead us forward and we are following with him, man, we will always see God bring the victory and win in the end. And remember God's heart is that all people would come into that victory and repent and turn to him. So we must get on board with God. We must stop fighting God. We must surrender our life fully to him and join with him. Say yes to the calling of God that he has upon your life. Don't say next month, next year. No, Lord, I'm fully ready today. I'm not, I don't feel ready, but I'm willing to be ready to surrender my life 
and do what you call me to do. And when we get on board with God's will, the Bible tells us very clearly, God is not against us, God is for us. And God will always be faithful. And we wanna be on God's side in the battle. Not saying, God, come and do what I want. No, no, Lord, I surrender, I wanna do what you will, and then I know you will win. And God has always been faithful in the past, and he will always be faithful in the future as well. Now look at verse 14. You thrust through with his arrows the head of the villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walk through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. Now he's describing here again the, the work of God through the Old Testament and that God did miracles for his people and he defeated his enemies. But as Habakkuk is recounting this, there's a, there's a double-edged sword. Yes, God is great and God wins, but oh man, when people do not surrender, they're going to face God's judgment and look at our nation. And now he starts to think about the, the disciplining and the chastening and the judging hand of God, that God is holy and the people have, have been living in idolatry. And he, he starts to realize the same power that was for us in, the, in the, those days, that power is going to be unleashed against us in, in my generation, in Habakkuk's day, 600 BC, the Babylonians are rising, just as God has been saying. And this was very sobering to Habakkuk because God's chastening is coming to the Jewish people for their idolatry and unrepentance. And now read Habakkuk's feelings about it in verse 16. He says, when I heard my body trembled. Oh, he, he's done the poetry here now. Now he's gonna just share his emotions. The reality of what's coming to Judah is settling in. Look at verse 16. My lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So Habakkuk now realizes that when Israel trusted and surrendered, God was fighting for them, but they haven't been, and God's going to discipline them, and he's going to send even the troops of Babylon with great chastisement upon his people. And Habakkuk is physically shaking because of this. He, he's trembling. The realization of coming judgment depletes his energy. He, he's sick to the stomach. And, you know, we can apply this to our lives too. Remember how good God is? and surrender to him. Get on board with God. Because if we walk in pride and we walk in rebellion, God will resist you. And it will not be fun. In fact, he will humble you. And if you continue to resist, he will bring righteous judgment. First Peter chapter five puts it like this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so in light of God's plans to direct the troops of Babylon to come in and bring discipline upon Judah, now look at Habakkuk. How is he going to move forward with all this mixed emotion? Well, actually what he does in verse 17 to 19 is he starts singing again. He starts praising. We could call verse 17 to 19 a hymn of faith. That's what it's described as in my Bible. And so let's read it. Verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on the high hills. And notice how he ends it, to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. So probably that Shigianoth was a stringed instrument. <laughs> but what we know is this is a song. This is to the chief musician. And, and he knows that he's had this crisis of faith. He sought the Lord. He's been through the valley and now God is turning his doubts and his questions into a testimony of praise and a sacrifice of praise of the lips to say, Lord, even though everything goes terrible in our nation, even though judgment is coming, yet I will praise you. I will trust you. I will keep walking with you. Look closely at verse 17. Habakkuk is saying, 
I'm going to choose joy even in the worst circumstances, even when God brings discipline through Babylon's brutal hand in the near future. Verse 18 is a choice to follow the Lord, even in dire circumstances. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And the words in the Hebrew are interesting. The word rejoice, olaz, it means to jump up and down. And the word joy in verse 18, gil, it means to spin around. He's saying, even in the worst of times, I will jump up and down. I will spin around in triumph and joy because my trust is in the Lord, the God of my salvation. Wow, that is faith. That is praising God with joy. You know, when I'm in trials, I do not feel like jumping up and down and spinning all around. I feel like, God, get me out of this. And the Lord's saying, no, watch what I'm going to bring out of this. Watch what I'm going to do. Keep trusting me, Colin. Keep believing And now he's choosing to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And although he doesn't understand, although he probably doesn't like the idea that God's going to send Babylon on our nation, he doesn't like it, but he chooses to remember the goodness of God in the past, and he trusts God to work things out for good in his day and in the future. Wow, this is faith. You know, you can question God's ways. That's okay. Bring your honest questions to God. But don't question his nature and his goodness. I could put it to you like this. Faith doesn't always understand God's methods, but it always trusts God's motives. This is faith. And once we start seeing with faith, we can rejoice and praise him. Now, what he describes there in verse 17, he paints a picture of life that is coming where Production comes to an end, where life comes to an end as far as orchards and vineyards, of fields and crops becoming a wasteland. The livestock will starve and they will fail to reproduce. And in this agrarian farming society, he describes a future of devastation of all their livelihood, their economy, even their health, even their prospects for years to come. But he says, even though these things will happen, Even if everything we've worked for is spoiled and lost, even if we come to total ruin with our physical needs, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Even then, you can strip everything I have away, is what he's saying. But I still have the one thing I really need, and that is the faithfulness and the grace of God. And that's how we can be praising him and thankful to him, even when we're in a crazy trial or a time of loss and devastation or a time of uncertainty and confusion. I will spin around. I will jump up and down. I will praise the Lord because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is the one who is my real need, and he is with me. And he will work this all out in his great plan, and I will surrender to his purposes and cry out for his mercy and for revival. That's the message here. You know, one modern day believer, he took this passage and he was going through a trial where he lost his job, he couldn't provide for his family no matter how hard he tried, he was facing financial ruin, couldn't find work, so he wrote this out in his own words. He put it like this, though the job offers do not come, and there is no employment on the horizon. Though the stock investments decline and my RRSPs produce no income. Though there are no savings in my account and minimal cash in my pocket, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me walk on the edge with sure feet and he calms me so I can enjoy the view. Wow. Look at verse 18 again and underline the words, I will. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. That means it's a choice. A choice to choose joy even in distress. Now, how do we do that? Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not encouraging you to go home and try and muscle this out in your own power and say, I will just force joy. Ah, I'm happy. (laughs) 
You can't do it. You can't, you can't force joy. What you need is a clear perspective that comes from the word of God. You can't will your way through this, but you have to choose it. So how do we do that? We ask the Lord to give us a higher perspective in our life, a greater view of our life, a bigger view of what he is doing and how big he is. Look at verse 19. Here's the greater view. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. So the key here is he says, the Lord God is my strength. I'm going to find my strength not in myself, not in my own will, but in God's mercy and grace and power in my life his goodness and faithfulness. He is my strength. And when you're suffering, when you're weighed down with burdens and fears, even when your dreams seem to be going down the drain, the choice is before you to open your heart to him, to choose to seek him and trust him and praise him. And then you will find that he really is the Lord God and he is your strength. Truly, he is your strength. He provides strength every day. He provides it moment by moment. He pours it in. He doesn't just send strength to you. He is your strength. He wants to be close to you, not just to send provision, but that he himself is your provider and he loves you. He knows what is best and you can trust him and you can rest in him. Let me ask you, are you saying with Habakkuk today, the Lord God is my strength? Is that the prayer and the belief in your heart? Because he really is. Is your heart now ready to even worship him in trials, to praise him and rejoice in him when you don't understand? You know, when we truly believe and when we look to him as our strength, we see in verse 19 that he will lift us up and help us walk on treacherous ground with confidence. Look at verse 19. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. Now, why this picture of a mountain deer or goat? Well, deer are stable-footed, even in precarious situations. And this is what the Lord wants to give you, is stability, even in precarious times. God can make you stable in high-pressure situations. Deer are amazing. You've seen the mountain goats. You've seen the ibex. You've seen these creatures, how they can find purchase and footing and balance on the edge of a steep and dangerous spot. They may only have two inches of footing, but they, for them, that's fine. No problem. <laughs> and this is what he's praying. Lord, you are going to lift me up to a higher view, and you're going to give me balance and confidence and stability because you are my strength. And I'm going to experience you in a new way through this trial. And God doesn't say, I'm just going to take it away. He says, I'm going to show you what you're going to take from this and what I'm going to do. When it looks impossible, you know, these creatures, let's put the picture back up. I, I just love that picture. See how they, they're just on this, it, it looks impossible. They're going to fall. Surely they're going to fall. And you see them take a step. Oh, here it comes. And yet they don't fall. And this is what the Lord wants to give to you. Traversing wild terrain, doing it with calmness, with confidence in the Lord. No fear, no stress. And with every step of faith, the Lord brings you to a higher view and a greater perspective on who he is and what your life is all about. It's not about your temporal needs. It's not about your immediate comforts. It's about so much more. And so too, when we choose to trust and rejoice in God, no matter what, he will help us ascend to this place of faith and praise. He'll help us keep believing him even in dire circumstances, and he'll give us this elevated perspective. And when all the resources of man fail, yet we have his promises and God will sustain us because he is doing something so much bigger and so much greater. So keep calm. Keep confident your strength is in the Lord and keep praising him and rejoicing in him and thanking him for his goodness, even when things seem impossible, confusing, 
and bleak because it's not. The Lord is taking you to higher places with him. Let's pray. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're in a place right now of disappointment and hurt and confusion. Perhaps you've even felt like you're right on the edge of a big fall. But the Lord wants to give you deer's feet. He wants to give you his joy. He wants to give you his stability and strength because God has a plan. And God is graciously working circumstances right now, taking you to a deeper faith because he's wanting you to walk on higher ground, on high places with him. And so, Lord, we pray today, help us choose thanksgiving. Help us choose joy. Help us choose to praise you and remember how good you are. And Lord, in your wrath that's coming upon this world, remember your mercy. Pour out revival upon each one of us today that we can walk fully surrendered, trusting and believing and obeying you. Lord, responding to your call. And Lord, doing so because you have been faithful in the past and even in the present, we trust you, even when we don't understand. And so, Lord, help us. Revive your work in our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you're here today, and the Lord is just calling you back to himself to surrender your life to him. And he's showing you that he loves you, that he's faithful, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live that perfect life, to die in your place and to rise again. And his hand is outstretched, offering mercy and grace if we will take it. But he calls us to trust him. The just shall live by faith. He calls us to surrender to not be resisting God and fighting God, but to let down the defenses and to receive his grace. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your cares on him right now. He cares for you. And so, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here and even those who are ready to put their faith in Jesus Christ for the first ever time. Lord, bring us to you. Help us surrender all. Even now, Lord, we make the choice to say yes to Jesus. Yes, Lord, here's my life. Yes, Lord, I believe you. Yes, Lord, I trust you. Yes, Lord, I surrender all. And Lord, I'm thankful for your goodness and mercy. And if it's the first time that you are receiving the Lord or if you've strayed away and you're coming back, come to the cross, lay your sins down, confess them to him now. Not every one by name, but the whole package in one shot. Lord, here it is. I'm a sinner. I have lived in re rebellion and pride. And Lord, I'm, 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 I'm at the end. I'm at the end of my own path and I'm willing to walk your path. I'm willing to surrender and make you my Lord and my Savior. And so today I turn from self-centeredness and pride. I turn from my sin and I receive the grace of God. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your, your work for me on the cross. And I lay my sin down and I let you take it. And Lord, I ask you to save me, to wash me, to cleanse me, and to come and live in my heart and to lead me and help me walk with you all the days of my life. Help me live for a greater purpose. Help me walk those high hills, not pulled down anymore, but walking above the circumstances with the joy of the Lord. And I receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.